and I was dying and everything in me was just going, just stop, you can just stop. You don't have to, you have to go down a rec-. And I knew guys, if I stopped, I'll, I'll be quitting for the rest of my life. I did, he, he pulled out this silver foil, ch- chucked a rolled up banknote in my mouth and then he heated this tiny little crystal that looked like a grain of rock salt. And it slowly slid down this, they call it a slide. I, got really, really broken. It ended up with not just stuff that happened with a triad, some of it was like really nasty. I had one moment where, for all intents and purposes, they were gonna kill me. So I've now lived, worked and traveled in 85 countries across all seven continents. Societies destroy people. Society traumatizes people from birth. School systems indoctrination. It's all called what I call controlled by Big Club, which is this network of international uh, psychopath trillionaire businessmen. So that you know, this is all stuff people can do tomorrow morning. It is simple. It's what I teach in life coaching. It's so simple, but you have to love yourself enough to take action. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Chris Thrall. How are you, Chris? I'm very fine, thank you, sir. Good, thanks for coming on. Um, And for those that might not be familiar with you, mate, um, you do many things, so where do we start? So, ex-Royal Marine, um, author, adventurer, endurance athlete, um, veteran of the year, um, I think for inspiration in particular, I believe. Um, but I believe there was a bit of a gap, I think, you know, from going from Royal Marine to all these other things that I mentioned, um, there was obviously a bit of a story there. I think you found yeah. yourself in Hong Kong at some point. Um, let's, so it'd be, let's stick on the other stuff. You made me sound good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would be amazing is if we can maybe just, I don't know, get a little bit of a uh, back, back story on you. Um, so from Royal Marine, sort of, you know, that, that kind of time in Hong Kong and, and, and kind of what you discovered about yourself during that period. And then obviously bring us right up to date with some of the stuff that you're, you're currently doing. It'd be amazing. Absolutely. Be delighted. Go for it. Right. Okay. So s- brief synopsis then. So I was homeless in a Renault 12. Fortunately, it was a state, so you could sleep in it. When I was 17, I uh, was homeless for the second time in my life. So that gives you an idea of the kind of turbulent, upbringing <laughs> yeah. mm. I, I went through um, and a mate come up rock, knocked on the window one day he says wait um, I just joined the Royal, Royal Marines Commandos I've just done this three day course up at Limston Commando and it was it was so tough and they put us through the endurance course and this assault course and, 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 and you know most of the people dropped out or, or, or fainted and, uh, and he said uh, of course, you couldn't do it. Ah, oh, did he? <laughs> yeah. And there's a point to this story. So there's me, angry young man, not a vi- particularly violent, but, you know, I, you don't tell me what I can and can't do. So it was uh, Christmas holiday. Uh, and I think it might have been New Year's Eve. We were at his place having a few beers. And I thought, right, I left the party about midnight, went out to Dartmoor, we, I mean, the village was on Dartmoor, so... And I thought there was this rock that was about... Well, it was half a mile away from his house, a very um, featured landmark, you can say, on Dartmoor. I thought, if I can run around that non-stop, so a mile, I'll go down to the recruiting office on the Monday and I'll sign on the dotted line. But if I can't do it, I won't waste their time. The point to this story is nothing to do with the military. It's the fact that I was so hanging out. I mean, that point where you just feel you're going to die. Never did I know at that reason I'd end up running a thousand miles pretty much nonstop. (laughs) Um, That's the uh, the length of Britain. And I was dying and everything in me was just going, just stop, you can just stop. You don't have to, you have to go down a, rec- and I knew guys, if I stopped, I'll, I'll be quitting for the rest of my life. Yeah. That, that, 
that was my name in the stone then, a quitter, you know. And I didn't know anything about motivation then. I wasn't, we didn't have all the books and internet that we have now. I just, something, a voice inside said, quit now. Don't you dare waste the Royal Marines time and you'll be a quitter for life. And it was probably the first real life lesson. Mm. The, feel, the first time that the universe spoke to me. Um, and it was a, yeah, it was a powerful, powerful lesson. So... Brief synopsis then, so I, st and you can then ask, ask me what you like, obviously, because it's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, uh, I passed, uh, passed out as a Royal Marines commander, I served in the Northern Ireland conflict in one of the particularly kind of nasty years over there, trained in Arctic warfare up in Norway, served as part of an um, uh, a high security detachment on an aircraft carrier protecting certain weapons that I don't think I'm allowed to talk about <laughs> but I think everyone can guess the ones the, the ones that make the big 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 bang um and um I left the marines because I like a lot of people who get to the sort of seven year between seven and ten year stage I felt like I've done this experience now. It, it was great. You know, it was a, it, it, there were some fantastic parts of it. There's some not so fantastic parts, which I think um, don't probably don't get highlighted enough. But um, that's another story. And um, I ended up in Hong Kong. I started a marketing business while I was in the Marines. Mm -hmm. It happened to really take off in the Asia Pacific. And I found myself in a, in a um, network marketing company, the third position from the top or, or of what they called a compensation plan. So I was a silver executive distributor. Um, I've just got gold and then diamond is millionaire for, for life. And, and I had the biggest business for this whole company that had been operating in America pre for, for two years previously. And I was the one that had <laughs> nailed, nailed Asia and, and everyone signing up in Asia was all in what we call my downline. So I'm getting 5% off my first check while I was in the Marines. And you've got to remember, this is 30 years ago now was 2,564 quid. So probably like getting about eight, eight, eight grand now, plus I'm getting more money from the Marines. So I thought I'd made it, went out to Hong Kong. Uh, within seven months, I was chronically addicted to crystal methamphetamine. Uh, the, I, I lost an endless series of jobs, some of them utterly cra crazy, we'll probably talk about that. Finally ended up working uh, for the 14K, who are a Hong Kong triad family so anyone who's traveled asia will know is the the mafia run all yeah. the nightclubs probably they're probably doing plymouth they're, they're <laughs> certainly doing soho mm. don't they you know when i say mafia i mean organized crime hong kong's no different in one chai which is your um those people that still read books will know about Susie wong uh, i think they made it into a film famous um uh, it was a famous book that was written. It was in one chai. It's where all the sailors go. It's the, they don't have red lights, but it's where all the girly bars are, it, it, expat bars. It's, it's a, a crazy place. And um, I worked in a club that I call Nemo in my book. Um, and the 14K ran it. So I was never a triad. I've never tried to claim I was a triad. Did I want to be one? Probably a little bit. These, <laughs> you know, these guys have got all the big dragon tattoos and the muscles. They, they, to say they was hard as nails, you, you have no idea. Yeah. Savage in a fight, savage. And they're like, I'm part of the family now. I wasn't a triad, but I mean, in the workplace, in, in, um, in Chinese etiquette, is boss looks after worker in return worker respects boss so they they take me for for breakfast in the morning with all all these you know, chinese hard nuts and stuff and yeah i, I felt uh, as someone that um 
like a week earlier, I've been chronically addicted to crystal methamphetamine, literally in clinical psychosis. So I'm hearing all kind of weird voices, mo mostly my own, coming up with all kinds of random, like I couldn't even, you know, re read... <laughs> um, I couldn't even read the back of a book, the blurb on the back of a book without thinking it was some kind of esoteric, like Illuminati instruction, uh, that there's there's some massive code that pervades the whole world and and it's kind of funny really because now I do actually believe there's a <laughs> a big cult that controls the world but then it was it was the you know the uh, the drugs talking you can say. so how how did you initially get onto crystal meth because it's quite a serious drug was but did you dabble in drugs before that or um, did you just I'd go been in? Um, in the dance era so what was that started in summer of 89 didn't it and it, it started great, to great get, year that great yeah year. yeah that's when i was born <laughs> <laughs> oh my god while you were doing your disco biscuits he was coming out the womb mate yeah <laughs> hey your mum and dad could have put you in one of them shoulder things they have a glass the kids at glass for the put you see the kids at glass with their, their earphones yeah, on the fenders, and, they're, yeah, and yeah. they're boffing up oh, and down yeah. i love that i love that not that i been to glass for me for years but anyway I, I was after one of the sort of I think greatest experiences of a lot of our lives was the the dance music era I think a lot quote unquote it woke a lot of us up to the uh, utter programming that we'd all been put through and it you know it like Young people are lucky now. If they want, all the information's out there. If you care yeah. about your life, you can just go on the internet, find the right sites, find people that care about you, and it's all that. We didn't have that. We had three channels on the TV, all of them owned by what I call the big club or controlled by the big club, putting out this lying narrative to you that we didn't know it was a big lie because we didn't there's no alternative right well, yeah you had one box that you watched yeah, didn't you? you know yeah. what i mean and that was it and and um and we had our parents and our parents you know bless them they didn't know an awful lot they just got told what to do by their parents and very often they didn't have the ability to reflect or rationalize on it or see that like this isn't that you know beating the shit out of kids isn't actually really helpful um da -da -da -da. the stuff that went on in schools was just people would be astounded now. And pe young people listen now, if you told them, any, in, in, in school, teachers were just basically abusers. Mm. They'd beat the hell out. They could beat the hell out of you. They could strip you off and beat you in front of the class. And no one batted an eyelid. That was normal back then. And so you can understand how... Getting into the dance scene, um, which broke through all social constructs, all all these barriers that have been put in. What through, through the drugs, through like acid yeah, and LSD, through, through and ecstasy, um, and, and 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 the music was was just incredible. You know, all music that's put out is designed to put people on a downer. It's always about. I'm lost in love. You don't love me anymore. <laughs> you loved me on a Friday, but you didn't love me on a Tuesday. And I'm such a big, massive loser. <laughs> no, you, you, you know, it. Yeah. It, it's pro it's called programming yeah. because the big club, they own all of it. They, they, they own the music industry. They own hot, their own Hollywood, Hollywood, the same. It's always the hero story. You're a loser in life. We're all scum. But if you can climb a big mountain or win a rugby match against South Africa or run this, oh, then you, 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 you've broken the loserness and you're a hit. And, it, and it's a big lie. We need to be teaching young people, no, you're a legend from birth. You're perfect as you are. You don't need to be chopping bits off your body or sticking bits on or taking tablets or, you know, it's fine to be different. It's absolutely fine, right? But going back to the, the the dance era, this is what a lot of us were woken up to. Not everyone. Some people just went back to being asleep again. <laughs> I meet I meet I meet I meet them now. They, they just buy the official narrative hook, line, and sinker, and they're on their I don't know eighth booster or something. Um, but yeah, it was a big big wake up. So that was that. Plus the fact you got to listen to awesome uplifting music that was about 
you know, raising your consciousness. We are one love. Everyone is equal. You know, get out there, smash your goals, smash your dreams. Anything you can perceive you can achieve. Completely different to this dirgy, you know. And um, so that was that. And I, of course, I've been through severe trauma in my childhood. I mean, severe, severe trauma. And that meant that it, it means a lot of things. I'm predisposed to want to learn about life because I need to understand what, you know, why stuff happened to me that didn't happen to the other kids. Mm. So I'm going to try anything that might give me an answer. So that makes me probably f a bit stupid <laughs> and a bit fearless. Um, and it, and the, the other thing is that we get so programmed into a low vibrational consciousness. They call it the matrix. You know, you live in a matrix. You think that the TV's real and, you know, and, and you, 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 you get told you're a loser so you don't bother going traveling or you don't learn how to fly planes or you don't jump out them or you don't, uh, you know, run the length of the country or you row across the Atlantic, which we're, we're doing next year. You know, you, you, you're like too scared to do all that because you'll just, you just go to the job and have your two weeks in IB for in the summer, you know? I'm not criticising people. I'm saying this is called the matrix, right? The thing about, uh, I'm not, I won't keep using the buzzwords on your podcast, but the thing about, let's just call it experimenting, is you, sh you artificially shift that vibration temporarily. Then it crashes to... <laughs> shit to high heaven for a few but and you start to learn stuff about you about life about other people because you've kind of artificially opened your third eye and you start to see that the narrative that the quote unquote psychopaths put out it's not it's not real it's 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 everyone's living in a delusion or an illusion so when i got to hong kong it was really boring. And when my friend, I uh, worked with a schizophrenic chap um, uh, in my book, he's called ne Neil Diamond. His uh, real name was Tom Jones. But I just <laughs> picked, picked what I thought was like an appropriate pseudonym. Anyway, um, he, I, I, was, I went to take a leak. It was the bathroom was on the floor downstairs and I'm there at the urinal. And I, mm, what's that sort of pungent, fragrant sort of, smell and then I turned and I, I saw uh, uh, Neil coming out of the cubicle and he said Chris come in here right I thought great I'm going to get a shag <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted two things didn't he really? <laughs> yeah, there you go that's yes um, uh, no I I knew what this was about it was about <laughs> drugs wasn't it and and because i'd you know i'd never had a problem with any of this sort of stuff i you know the i think we all got a bit like addicted to soap bar hash back in the day that was a difficult one to give up everyone that said they were going to give it up the three days later back on it again mm, it that yeah. was that was a bad one that funny enough but anyway never had a you know ma major problem with anything i d he, he pulled out this silver foil chucked a rolled up banknote in my mouth and then he heated this tiny little crystal that looked like a grain of rock salt mm. and it slowly slid down this they call it a slide um and he went suck it suck it oh I went, okay and i've got the the two and a, I, I just literally just took one tiny bit of vapor it was it, knowing what i know now it was like ridiculous it was a, like a great a, uh, the fraction was grain it? of sand on yeah. the beach you know right, okay. none, and, and went back to my desk and within about 30 seconds i you know let's just say the results uh, i'm going to be careful what i say because you funny enough you're not allowed to describe the feeling of this being on on you know experimenting on on youtube but let's just say um I never felt like that before in my life. It was like the key in the lock for me. Uh, I, I, I would guess that when you've been through trauma, 
you're constantly suffering flight or flight syndrome. Your yeah. your adrenaline it's all res always you know you, you 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 because from a very young age before you was too old before you were old enough to process it you you've been put on edge and it's deeply entrenched in your mind. So I think that guys like me we go through life with a high level of stress that we think that we think that's life you know what this stuff does is just get that's gone that's out the window you're suddenly feeling like the best guy in the universe uh, you like you're like you've seen highlander yes you know <laughs> i i am everything i can do anything i can be any you know that kind of that's it, it is just un unreal and i knew sat there i was looking at the, i was clock watching the big clock Seven o'clock we had to work to. We worked 12 hour days. I'm like, come on, come on, come on. I have my bag ready in my hand, all packed up. Come on, come on, go. Right, boom. And I knew I was out that door and off to Chunky Mansions, which is the get uh, ghetto. Five, uh, it's like four or five tower blocks that form this ghetto in Hong Kong. It's where all the emigre community live because it, it, it's, it, it's pr probably quite different now, but it was back in the day, it was cheap. It really smelled of curry everywhere because it had a big, you know, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian sort of community. And that's not a criticism, but it did have a bit of a hum, to be honest. It's just, you know, it was a real, it was, it, 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 a lot of stuff went on in there. You know, yeah, anything you wanted, you went to Chunky Mansions, whether it was a, you know, sex or whatever. Anyway, I knew a Ghanaian immigrant in there called Mark, big, like Mike Tyson looking like guy, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he, that was a slightly different story. I says, Mark, have you got any of this, this ice stuff? He said, oh, I sold my, I sold my last deal in the day. I'm like, oh, puck, right? That's a red flag there. You know, if you go in a co-op to get some milk or some eggs or something and they've run out, you don't shout out, oh, <laughs> yeah. you know that, that's a little especially after one like <laughs> yeah. pace, you know what I mean it's like yes you know at this point you're not an addict yes. do you you know yes. you just you just experienced it um but I was very realistic when I started to find I couldn't uh, get past Chim Sa Choi underground station on my way home I lived in Mong Kong the most heavily crowded area on the planet right What's that like? So just quickly, just I don't want to dive out too much. Uh, but I, I've seen I've seen videos so and stuff, and I it looks insane. Yeah, I later went to live in uh, uh, the back of Wan Chai, which was like a Bruce Lee film. Literally, really? yeah, cats and dogs lazing in the street, little people bobbing around with a traditional Chinese garb on, which you don't you I don't think you'd see that now. People running up and down the street pulling the. The, the barrows with good goods <laughs> to go to show. Oh, it's, it was, it, I mean, the first time I ever went to Hong Kong, which was during my time in the Marines, I got a cheap, what we call indulgence flight, 40 quid. I went there because I saw the John Claude Van Damme film. Which one? I can't remember the name. It's in my uh, memoir, Eat and Smoke. It's got to be Bloodsport, isn't it, surely? Uh, put it in the comments, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember watching that and he ran across the junks the boats in Hong Kong Harbour and I'm like what I can go there for 40 quid and the military will you know and it was a British Airways flight as well proper big yeah. big 747 I drank more than 40 quid's worth of beer on the, on the, on the flight <laughs> and I just had the most incredible time and I love that I just love that Chinese, ancient Chinese culture, the Kung Fu, the, the dragon tattoos, the eating with the chopsticks, you know, just bring it on. Just incredible. I, I, I loved Hong Kong. I loved it. Anyway, um, so just, just fast forward a bit. So, yeah, I got really, really broken. It ended up with not just stuff that happened with a triad. Some of it was like really nasty. I had one moment where for all intents and purposes, they were going to kill me. And I had to face it that there was nothing I could do. And What that, was that over? Was that money, drugs? Yeah. I was so unwell at, by this point. So I'm a doorman on a nightclub, right? I say doorman, I wasn't going to be like, you know, what I really was was a go-between between the Chinese, what we call face, pride, 
and stupid Western drunken ignorance mm. of having right, dickheads okay. come out of their, you know, million dollar office going, ah, oh, 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 don't you tell me what, you know, I'm going to punch that. And, and it's like, mate, mate, calm down. <laughs> You've got to you get know killed. that gentleman. <laughs> We say, you know that gentleman you just threw a drink over, he's kind of like the most important man in Wan Chai. And you see them seven guys there all wearing white shell suit tops and gold jewellery, all looking at you like they're going to kill you. Uh, that's because they are, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is what it was, you know. So my job was to kind of go, oi, mate, 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 calm, calm down. You know, let's go for a walk. Why don't we go to another nightclub? And um, got got really ill with it. Saw some stuff, you know. My my the chap, the doorman on my left, Chu Chai, he's uh, Magi. So they, that's like a runner, a bottom level of the triad food chain, as it were. He's a street fighter, so he's just he'll savage anyone in a fight with whatever he can pick up, right? Um, it's kind of funny. I didn't know whether the guy loved me or hated me. One day he'd come in and he'd, he'd go, and he's, he's saying, I've got smelly feet, which, which this is not another story. <laughs> Next day he'd come in and he'd just get, he'd give me 40 knocked off Marlboro, you know, faked in China or smuggled off one of the ships. You know, I got in a fight one time with these expats. Um, and I was just like, went out, <laughs> launched after this guy. And uh, the next thing you knew, the two triads behind the bar, they just jump over the bar, knocking all the drinks off. Ice bucket goes flying. One of them grabs the ice tongs, you know, a weapon. The other guy grabs the ashtray. Chu Chai comes running over. And, and this expat kind of shoots out the club. <laughs> uh, and, they, and they were so angry for me. They were like, he come here. He come here again. I make one phone call. One phone call. Everyone come here, kill him, <laughs> you know? And that's how they operated. Yeah. Triads just had to give one, this was the early days of mobiles, Hong Kong being Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. They had that technology yeah. before we did, you know? They only had to broadcast one code word. That would just then get broadcast to all the other triads on the doors. And they would just, you know, it was, it was phenomenal. It was fascinating. But... Cut long story short, I ended up one day, I was so unwell. I lived in this decrepit old building. I was on like the 20th floor, I was sleeping like on a bamboo bunk that I built for myself. And I was so unwell that I went up on the roof and there used to be this wire cable going across to the building on the other side of the Jaffe Road it was in Hong Kong. Um, and it had a water pipe attached to it. You get a lot of homeless community live on the roofs in Hong Kong. Um, I don't know if it was something to do with that. There was a homeless guy on the top of our roof and it used to fascinate me because he, 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 I'd say looking back, he was clearly mentally unwell. But, you know, one day I, I went, I, I mean, I'm off my head all the time. He used to go on the roof and practice Kung Fu. And there's all these TV areas, like thousands of them from over the years that have all collapsed in the typhoons. And they put a new, and it was weird. It was like, a, like the forest floor with, fern fronds but they were all tv areas and stuff and one day i looked over this little um, parapet thing and he's down there and he's built a shack for himself out of like crates and stuff and he was burning these little bits of paper and i'm just fine I, well, why <laughs> why what's that about is he a like some taoist ritual or some just weird but anyway i went up one day and in my mind I had to crawl across this cable. And in my mind, that was what my commando training was for. That was why I'd gone up to Limpston all those years before, was for this moment in time. And if I could crawl across this cable between these two, there weren't so much skyscrapers, but they may have well have been because it was like 70 meters up in the air. Um, you know the Marines, when you lay your belly on a, on a wire and you pull yourself across and you dangle your leg for, for support. It's one of the one of our, uh, you know, something a commander needs to be able to do. Put it that way, and um, and everything in my mind is telling me when I get to the other side, I'm going to get all my answers in life. You know, there's probably going to be everyone I've ever met over there just waiting for me, and they're going to be like, "Well done, 
you know, you, we've waited a long time for you, Chris, but you, you finally got here, mate. You know, where, where have you been? So, you know, I thought it was just going to be like this big homecoming and, and I, 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 I don't know, like be accepted or uh, I, I, this is how I'm a well. And I've got, I've got a few feet out on this wire and it's like swaying. I'm looking down at people on the street below and they look like, like ants, you know, and I'm thinking, are they looking up at me thinking this, you know, what, what, I wonder what they're thinking. And cut long story short, I started thinking of my little brother uh, who I love dearly. And we grew up together and we used to sit on the, there was a play, on one of our parents' numerous separations. And I think there's been about like four, four or five remarriages with my parents and divorces and deaths and all that kind of stuff. Although the, 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 I was an adult when, when people started dying. Um, but on one of our numerous separations, we got taken 300 miles up north straight. I mean, imagine going from Devon up to Lincolnshire, completely different way of life, different mindset. You've got to go to another school. I went to six, I think I went to five schools by the time I was 11, if you include the nursery school thing. Um, that's five lot of bullies that you got to fight, you know. It, 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 five lot of new teachers that scared the it out of you because mm-hmm. they, they just weren't in touch with Kit, you know. And me and my brother at this school, they had a rule, big kids are not allowed in a little kid's playground. And I was a big kid and he was in a very jun- junior year. So we used to sit on the steps between the playgrounds. Um, I'm almost crying just thinking about it, just so I could be with my kid brother and not be lonely, you know, and confused with all that divorce shit. Um, and I loved my, you know, I, lo- I loved him. He, he was my best friend. And I'm there in Hong Kong and I realised I ain't called him for a year. What I've been so off my head and, and into my narcissistic little world of being a doorman or a DJ and dancing my ass off with a Filipino, you know, girls every night. And did, uh, and in that moment, I just had a nervous breakdown. And I think number one, I'm just crying and the tears are dropping out of my eyes and they're going into the darkness like paratroopers from the Hercules, you know, it was, I just remember it. And, and I got off that wire, I thought, what are you doing, Chris? You could get halfway across. You didn't put it up here. The Marines didn't build it. it, it it's probably some cowboy work when it's going to snap. And, and do you know what they'll say? They'll say, oh, your, your son got addicted to drugs in Hong Kong and he threw himself off a skyscraper. And it wouldn't have been true. I was never going to do that to myself, you know? Yes, I had a few issues on my plate, but deep down I respected and loved myself. In a, you know, I'm obviously not doing a good job of showing it, but there's no, you, you know, mm-hmm. I was I was on a quest. I was trying to find out who I was, not not like. Anyway, cut long story short, got back to UK. It, 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 it took me about 18 months to get my stuff together. You know, um, the gear here wasn't as strong as it was in. There's, can you even get crystal meth in the UK? Because I always associate this with like an American or, or I, that one. I always bog the bounty hunter. Have you ever watched that? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's on fucking crystal yeah, meth on but that. It, it in Hawaii. It's prevalent in the, in the States, but I've never really come across it here. Uh, so, well, there's a couple of answers to that. First of all, on the dark web, you can get anything. Yeah, okay. Um, don't know if I should be promoting that, but you just, you just can. Secondly, uh, apparently in the gay community they've got the contacts to get to, to you know to get that stuff but for people who wonder what it is it's pure amphetamine it's pure base amph- pure methamphetamine so when you buy let's just say you bought a rapper speed in a club back in the day do you got like two percent amphetamine in it you know of, of uh, the rest of its glucose and stuff this is not just a hundred percent of that amphetamine is a hundred percent refined, so it's got all the impurities taken out. That's why it looks like gla- they call it glass or ice, right? It's just, and it and it it's just incredibly, incredibly strong. You really don't need a lot of it. It's not like say I don't know coke where you get a hundred quid wrap or fifty quid whatever you pay and it's gone by the morning. You know, it, this is like you get that 
you pay that same money for crystal meth, you still got it almost at the end of the week. It's mm -hmm. just, but, um, so there wasn't much around in the UK then when you got back. Yeah, I shouldn't have dabbled, but you know, I, my journey hasn't ended yet. I'm still, you know, it's got to end when it, when it ends. And obviously it wasn't the right time. I dabbled a bit. I went back. Luckily my, my dad and my uncle had kept hold of my house for me and they'd spoken to the mortgage people and said, look, he's really, you know, I'm, I'm well, please don't repossess his house. And they said, okay. And, um, under the circumstances we'll freeze like the mortgage payments and just pay the interest. It was some, something like that. So I still had, to, but I gradually trashed it. I got unweller and unweller. Um, I was, doing my fortnightly shopping and I'd be, I'd have like one pound 64 to, to feed myself for two weeks. All the rest had gone on gear, you know? So was it still crystal meth at this point or were you taking uh, it? It was what, what we call base back in the day. Yeah, so okay, strong right. form of amphetamine yeah. by this time I'm injecting it because that was a whole like, you know, uh, a, a, a playing out like a like a routine that, that added to it and you you sort of controlled it a bit it, it was messy fellas you know and i'm 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 shopping with 164 i'm buying por big like two kilo bag of porridge and a tea kilo bag of no frills pasta and i'm mixing them together you know putting 20 spoons of sugar on just for energy because I was starving all the time. I, was, I mean, sometimes I wouldn't eat for up to nine days and I'd be active. I wouldn't sleep either. It was just, it was crazy. And, um, and uh, I used to shoplift Bovril. That was like my treat is, you know, I've got this crappy white thin bread that you wouldn't feed a blooming dog now. Um, and uh, my treat was I'd shoplift a Bovril because there's no way I'd, you know, two pound eighty five or whatever it was. That was more than I had for the for the for the shot. I got bloody caught shoplifting once. If you were shoplifting, why wouldn't you get like a steak or something? Because nice? I was <laughs> stupid. You know? Do you know what I did? I'd shoplift myself a chocolate bar as a treat. Okay. Do you know which brand I'd shoplift? I'm guessing it wasn't Cadbury's. The bloody no frills brand. <laughs> why? <laughs> what? We're just, just but uh yeah the shop it was funny actually it was a it was a fellow serviceman was at the two I don't know if he was a marine or an army commando but you could just tell he was you know it was a commando and he just looked at me and went mate that geezer there's been following you all around the shop and I was like oh I'd clocked him I wonder why he was wandering around <laughs> with a baguette you know and I just went Thanks, mate. My love, I'll be back. Just pay for this in a set. And I, and, and, I, and I pretended I was like going off to have a word with again. And I wasn't. I got in the first hour and I grabbed the, the, the no frills <laughs> chocolate and I chucked it in the freezer compartment. And I got the bovril and I threw it, threw it up with the bloody Turkish delight or something, you know. And I went back. Yeah, anyway. So I got away with it is what I'm trying to say. But it was, it was acutely embarrassing. Do you find it, do you find it um, looking back on that time, do you find it really odd that the way you used to think, like when you're talking about that you wasn't thinking correctly and obviously being on drugs and then being off drugs and, and trying to go through that transition, is it really weird that you would make those decisions based on how you were feeling, even though you were sane, if that makes sense? It makes you kind of insane at times, doesn't it? Yeah, well, the thing is back in the UK, the psychosis had gone. The, because the level of that drug was so much weaker, right. even though, you know, I'm still off my head all, all the time, it's a very strange place to be, um, it it didn't peak the psychosis. I wasn't that unwell. A uh, couple of times I had a s bit of psychosis come back. One time it come back years later. Really? Uh, yeah, randomly we'd gone out and we'd, um, let's just say we might have popped a pill or something. And I remember standing in my hallway with, with one of my best mates, Mal. I went, yeah, well, I suppose we're all on the garage forecourt. He went, what? And I went, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking hell <laughs> <laughs> you know I just realised I just come out with something that just completely random yeah nothing to do with nothing and I that's psychosis you know 
Yeah. So just for those that might be listening that can't be asked to Google what psychosis is, is, is it is it hearing voices? Is that like the definition of it? Yeah, but it's not like you haven't got some devil going, right, okay, you know, go out and nab yourself a prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, put her in your white vat. It's not, it's not. For a start, I was fairly harmless, although you are, I mean, you know, you are susceptible you're vulnerable in that state, you know? It's like when you drink spirits, isn't it? They call it spirits because you you let the spirits in and you behave in, in a way that you just never normally would. And people can be, na you get the nicest, kindest person can suddenly just turn into the devil incarnate, you know? So, um, so yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> talking so much, forgot, forgot the question. Uh, the, the definition so, of psychosis. Yeah, so psychosis, it's, it's it's just a form of mental illness. It's a little bit like schizophrenia. You you could say you have moments of lucidity and you're fine. You, um, for me, as soon as I stopped the gear, it it stopped. Like literally within twelve hours, it was you know I was back to normal, cold, shivering, starving on the floor, wondering right, how am I going to feed myself today, um, and deal with this chronic depression when I didn't even know what depression was because no one talked about mental health back then. Yeah. Nobody knew. No one ever s explained, right, Chris, you come from quite a troubled background. When you get older, you're going to be experimenting with stuff to try and find out who you are. And along with that, you're going to get a dose of this. It's called chronic depression, you know, and, and you're probably going to get extreme anxiety and it might take the form of something called a panic attack where you're going to be like <laughs> you know i just get these panic attacks i didn't know what they were i just didn't know why i couldn't speak to someone that horrendous yeah oh, it was that horrendous just awful, you know um crazy but that's what psychosis is so i'd hear my voice kind of thing Coming out with just sometime, I'd, I'd, you'd have three voices. You'd have my voice now, then you'd have your own thoughts like, come on, Chris, time to get up and get out the door and do so and so. Da, da. But then you'd have this, yeah, time go out the door, out the door, number four. Oh, it's all about number four. <laughs> number, f And you'd be like, well, it's about number four, is it? Right, okay, number four, let's go to me trusted book. And I'd have these books that I thought, you know, like a Tony Robbins book. Mm -hmm. I thought I had all the cards. We looked right, number four, number... Uh, num num and then you, you just get into something else then and it would take... Yeah. And, and all your time would di disappear. It would be crazy. But cut a long story short, I woke up cold shivering on the floor one day. Um, I'd always had a good relationship with all the kids in my street and, and all their families. And they'd always knock on the door, Chris, come out, play football and all... And like I wasn't that guy anymore. I felt so ashamed of myself. I'm Did you have good people around you? Say again? Did you have good people no, around you? No, 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 no. Ev everyone you? disappears from your life when you're like that. Uh, but but let, let me just, there's a lesson to be learned there. Um, half, I wouldn't almost like blame people for leaving because, I mean, it was a man, my house was just you'd think that I fixed motorbikes in the front room. I mean, which I, well, I fixed, I fixed them in the kitchen, you know, spill a bit of shit on the line, just rip the fucking lino up, but, but burn that in the back garden, you, you, you know? Uh, it was just it was crazy, you know? I, I'm, I was 14 stone in the Marines and I'm now like nine and a half stone. And to you, you're still just normal to all the people around you it's it's like they see you know they they, they see, mm. uh, see a difference the clothes i had on i'd stolen off a of a, 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 a heroin user up in barnstable who'd ripped me off one day so i just thought right screw you mate and i went around his place i thought i'll have that i'll have that i, I was just you know what he, he's he, that's my all, all my all my fortnight's money you've just nicked me you know and it was it, it, and not i'm not trying to justify stealing but I'm wearing his clothes. Mm -hmm. he, the Nike Airs were, were a size too big for me, and I, I felt like goofy wearing them. You know, it, it, I used to cut my own hair, and it just, 
you know, try and give myself like one of those bobs that was fashionable, like those mank bobs that yeah. was fashionable <laughs> back yeah. in the day. You're giving yourself one of those. Yeah, but I do it. Just you take know, a bowl, mate. Don't you just cut around yeah, it? Yeah, but I'd end up with, like, with a razor blade and I'd cut, I'd yeah. get blood dripping down, and I'm dead, and 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 it, it was just, it was an awful, awful time, and. As I'm lying there shivering on the floor from where I'd collapsed unconscious probably like, you know, 15 hours earlier because I'd been awake for probably five days and my body, I just crap, you know. I, I couldn't go out, I was starving. I wanted to nip down a shop and get a pasty or something, you know. I think I had enough money that day for it. And I could hear the kids outside kicking the ball around and I knew if I go out, they're going to be, Chris, come on. And like, I ain't up for it, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not paranoia. It's that I'm. I just. I'm dishevelled. I'm. I've got such a low self image at this moment in time. I don't. You know. I can't face your parent going. Oi, Chris. Well, 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 I'm not. Am I? You know. I'm. I'm not in an half stone. I was four, fourteen when I moved here. Um. Um. um yeah. It, it, in in that moment, I just started thinking. You know. I just started thinking and um, I thought, I thought back to my child and I thought that little boy that didn't deserve all the shit that happened to him, you know, he didn't arm no one, did he? Kids don't arm people, you know? And I thought, yeah, but Chris, what adults did to you then, you're doing to yourself now, mate. You're the one abusing yourself with all this drug stuff. It was good in the early days of dancing, the learning. I found I could write, I could write poetry, I could draw pictures. I, my, I, you know, I was very popular doorman because I'd see someone in the queue, you know, that I might have chatted with a week, and I'd go, go on, mate, and I'd stamp their hand secretly. Go on, go on get yourself inside. And the Chinese loved it. That respect, you know. Oh, I'm going to buy you, buy you a meal. You know, I'm going to, you come, you know, I'll give you a job in my company. And all, it was just incredible. I was very, very good at that job in the early days. And as the meth kicked in, I've become like the person that shouldn't be doing that job. Yeah. But, um, and I, I, I had nervous breakdown. If by this time it's probably number three and I just cry my eyes out. And I just thought of that little boy that I was and what, what are you doing to him? What are you doing? What are you doing? doing it's not working Chris it's not look it's not working now is it used to be a big strong handsome marine driving a near new BMW with a f mobile when no people used to go what the hell is that right used to wake up after a night down Union Street with all these phone numbers in my pocket of all these different girls and oh yeah I remember that well yeah I think I'll give her yeah it was it, it was I mean, you know, I was young. I was, I was, these things are not so important to me now, obviously, but as a 20 odd year old, they, they, you know, that, that, and what was I now? I couldn't invite a girl around my, no, ne never. You know, I used to have a t immaculate house, brand new it was. I bought it nine months old, you know, and now it's like I've trashed the hell out of it. I, it's, and, I thought, right, okay, so it's not working anymore, is it? You know, this this illusionary, right, if I just get one more bag of gear, I'm going to, you know, that will help me to, it's, it's. so I thought, right, I don't want to be a choir boy. I'm not going to be joining the, the church. I'm not going to be going to AA meetings because I don't want to humiliate, you know, just, I'd find that humiliating. It's got to work, start with me. And I thought, right, cut down. Instead of spending all your money a fortnight, you're going to spend a tenner and that's it. And when that, that rap is gone, you're going to be manic and, you know, probably trash your house even more in an attempt to paint the front room. You know, it all, everything goes wrong on, on, on you when you live this life, you know. And I uh, thought, right, you just, you have your manic face, you're going to crash. And when you wake up, you're going to throw open that curtain you're going to throw off the depression and you're going to say, morning, son. Thank you for this life. And that's something I've done religiously every single day since. And in that moment, when I connected with that, let's just call it energy, mm -hmm. I knew my life was never going to be the same again. And I knew that it was something powerful that 
I hadn't known about. Fast forward to now, this was what, about 20, 20, 25 years ago. So I've now lived, worked and traveled in 85 countries across all seven continents. Um, um, I've written six books. One of them was an international bestseller. I'm a qualified, or my degrees in youth work. Um, I'm a, I've, I've explored the Antarctic Polar Circle, the scuba dive down there with um, icebergs and le leopard seals. I've driven journalists to India and back on an old school coach so we could write articles about people living in poverty. Um, I've taught street kids in Mozambique. Uh, I visit, visited every place on the planet that I ever dreamed to. I'm a qualified pilot, qualified skydiver. Uh, I ran the length of the United Kingdom, 36 ultra marathons in 36 days from John O'Groats to Land's End, carrying a 15 kilo Bergen full of all my, my camping gear. I come last in my first ever triathlon. So I said, right, in eight weeks time, I'm going to do a quadruple Ironman. <laughs> um, uh, I've, uh, yeah, I've run 200 miles around a running track uh, to raise awareness of veterans' mental health. Um, what have I done? I've done some stuff recently. I've done, I do quite a lot of stuff and I for, I'll forget it. <laughs> I'll, I'll forget. <laughs> Um, forget for, forget it all, but we're going to row across the Atlantic next year. We knocked up a hundred mile run for next month just to go out and do for a bit of fun around a beautiful lake on 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 uh, Dartmoor. I've got the most beautiful family that that I shouldn't really have. Um, and when I look at them, and you know, people don't understand. They say, "Oh, you." You've turned your life around. And I say, no, go and have a look at my son, who is literally the most handsome kid that God ever created, right? He's so, so funny. He's just such a little legend. Mm -hmm. You'll realise I've done everything right in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done everything right. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, it's... um mad story I've got a couple of questions yes that I've, talk, I just, I've talked that, a lot that, that are burning no, okay. <laughs> um, one is around the addiction mm. um, because everything you said there it, it seemed to stem from from sort of an internal place do you think addiction is do you think it's the, the personal the substance that creates the addiction uh, it's it's uh, nurture so nature or nurture you know are you born addicted to stuff yeah you're going to read scientific papers oh yeah your dad was a this you've got the gene I, it's a bit weak that really you've got to understand if you're smashed with childhood trauma you've always got that flight or fight mode mm. and if you grow up not understanding it and having it unresolved right then when a substance gets put in front of you that suddenly covers all that up and makes you feel like you know, it takes your mind off it for a start. Not, not that you know it's there. I mean, I didn't grow up going, hey guys, I'm a, I, got, I didn't even know that. I just knew there was some quite unpleasant stuff that, that, that I, you know, I, they call it intrusive memories. Um, I worked hard, went on a healing weekend recently and just as someone invited me, I thought, yeah, okay, I'll go. And off the back of a, of a, a plant ceremony you could say i realized that i've got to st stop that memory now is stop you know I, I don't go there anymore because um but no when this substance put in front of you and it like steamrollers over all that shit and you feel well it's it's very tempting to make that your normal you know so what do you do you chase it you do the same thing the next day then you do the the next day and what it does is neurologically, it sets a pattern in place of that's how you cope with stress. So, you know, go, go to a wedding, get drunk, go get fired by your boss, get drunk. You, you know, this it just becomes like a, 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 a mechanism. And over the course of 30 years, I mean, I was, you know, uh, I drank, smoked, talking weed and uh, and partied every week probably for like 35 years 
you know, uh, uh, every day, every day. Did you, I mean, did yeah. you try drug, drugs at a young age? So like the only reason I say it is one of the reasons I, I grew up in like a shit area and drugs were everywhere where I was. And I remember times when I was maybe 13, 14, people doing some hard drugs. And the one thing that stopped me doing drugs was the thought of my mum. <laughs> I thought of disappointing my mum to then have drugs. I like to do drugs and then get caught doing drugs and her having that opinion on me. So for you, if you was abused and treated shit, did that stop? That that thought probably didn't come into your head. You know, you you didn't give a fuck, I imagine, if your parents found out you were doing drugs. Whereas I think where my mum was always so good to me, for, for addiction, it's always about serving yourself first. Yeah. And yes, it is incredibly selfish. It's... I just mean that initial taking. Does that make sense? Like, I didn't even try it because yeah. of that reason. Yeah, and I'll tell sense? you what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm envious of you in the nicest possible way. For me, it's, yeah. it's I've never had that option. People think that you choose addiction because they see the physical action of you buying beer or you know oh he's been smoking they, they don't understand it, it's powerless it's out of your control it is possible to get control back over it which is what i i mean i spent yesterday live coaching a chap to, to explain how you know how it um how it all works but no it's generally nurture yeah okay. it's it's not to say that you know to have an addiction you had to have a tough childhood or a traumatic experience. Mm. Um, and it's not to say that if you have a tough childhood, a traumatic, you're, you're going to definitely become, you know, chatted to a guy yesterday on my podcast. He fell asleep at the wheel, rolled his car eight times, woke up to find that he'd unintentionally killed his wife and, and, and the baby had flown out the window. You know, very, very, very dear, you know, dear, dear chap. And um, um, I said to him, so your surviving son who was still in the car, what, did, did he go down the substance route? You know, I'm assuming he did. That's a big, yeah, and, and he's like, no, no, he's always been really well adjusted. Yeah. So it's, it's not to say that everybody, you know, but... Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's that's interesting. And and the other question I had, because obviously, you know, a lot of people suffer addiction, and as as you say, often because of nurture and and their kind of masking trauma, and and so many times, sadly, just people can't pull themselves out of it. So I guess the second question was, obviously, you've managed to do that, and it sounds like perhaps you've replaced, you know, substance abuse maybe with achieving goals and that type of thing. But what would your advice? To, to maybe addicts listening, what would that be in order to try and, you know, sort of gain back control, as you say? Right, so this all comes down to something called stages of change. There's a model you can look up. It was by two social scientists called Prochaska and Dick Clemente. And they worked out that everybody who changes, doesn't matter who you are, what you're changing for, it's all the same psychological process. It, it, everyone fits this model. So you get your pre-contemplation. That's when you're like, oh, I haven't got a problem, you know. Yeah, I like, I drink two bottles of wine a night, but yeah, I like it, don't I? And I still go to work, you know. It, you see the justifying the, the addictive, the addictive um, pattern. Then it gets to the point where they call it contemplative. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I'm like waking up a hangover. I'm upset me boss at work. I've just got no energy all the time. Um, it's costing me a bloody fortune. Uh, I think I might need to start making changes. That's called contemplative. So you've gone from pre-contemplative to contemplative. Then you've got action. It's like, do you know what? I'm going to try and knock it on the head for, you know, for a week. <laughs> good luck with that because <laughs> if you could do that you wouldn't you wouldn't be addicted would you if you had that can and and you try and you manage one day in two days and then you're like <sighs> okay right let's go down the tesco and you're walking down that the, the dreaded aisle in tesco again picking your beers and your and your whiskey or whatever that's called laps laps can be for a day two days Relapse can be two months, three months, 
in my case, it could be eight, eight, 18 months. Um, it, but it's fine. It's fine. In that period, it's a learning process. And you go back to your old ways and they don't, still don't work. And now you hate yourself even more because you said you didn't want to do that and that's why you were going to change. And then, and then the thing, the beauty about this circle is you can't go backwards on it. It's like, like you, you pedals on a bike that, I can't remember now, you know, you can go backwards, can't you? But you, then you can't go, it's, it's like that. It's like you're locked in. You might stay there a while, but then you go for, then you, then you get your head together and go, ah, right. I said I wasn't going to do this, didn't I? I said I wasn't going to put my family for it, spend the money, da 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 da. I've got to go for it again. And then that's, you contemplate it again, haven't you? So you, so you go again. And each time you have these lapses and relapses, they get smaller and smaller because you're starting to get it you know, um, t together. The problem is that's not too bad to do on something like crack, crystal meth, amphetamine, coke. Why? Because that stuff destroys your life really quickly. You know, from you doing your first, you know, lying a Charlie to it destroying your life it can be three months. It's, it, it, yeah, and, and you're in chaos and you're living in living hell. It's terror. You don't, you, you could, you, you know, paranoid to go into work and, and can't answer the phone, don't want to open your bills because, oh my God, they, they want more money from me and I haven't got it. You know, it's awful. When you live that long enough, it's easier just to bloody change and stop doing it, right? Mm. It's alcohol that's the problem. Yeah. Alcohol's the killer. It's legal. It's easy available 24 seven in this country socially acceptable it's you know it's what everyone does it's it's cultural so it's part of the culture get married drink get dead drink get fired drink get a new job drink you know and as such and and the problem with it is you can literally drink half a bottle of vodka before work and no one's gonna know you go about your day you know you get it you just get so used to the having this alcohol content in your body that you know as long as you put a breath mint in or something you know don't breathe on the wrong it, it's so easy to do yeah. you come back from work down the supermarket you know what it, i mean i was drinking like up to 12 cans of strong lager a night quite a lot um, done that quite a lot not always 12 cans but it's always been always been some, something and and the thing is, it's sustainable because you never hit that rock bottom. Yeah, you wake up with another hangover and you're like, oh, God. But by the time you've had a shower and you know, polish your shoes, you're, you're starting to feel a little bit back to, you know, and you can go into work and then you come back, have a quick beer, tidy all the mess from the night before and keep, keep on top of it. You know, you, you hold down a job so you've always got the money coming in so you can clothe yourself, you can get some food in the cupboard. You, 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 it's the other way, on, on the strong, stronger stuff, ironically, it just steals your life really, really quickly to the point where you can't, you can't continue it or you're going to end up street homeless and then probably dead. Um, so I'd say to everyone, do what I did. I'm stood there on Chimsai Choi Station, halfway between my work and my home, and I knew I couldn't stop going to see this guy, Mark. I, I just, I, and, and, and very quickly, within, we're talking about in two weeks, I'm like, you're addicted to this, Chris, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, I, I absolutely am. And this is going to be a roller coaster, mate, isn't it? You know, buy the ticket, take the ride up, and yes, mate, it is. Let's go, you know. But give me credit, I was always realistic with myself, you know. And, and if you can't be realistic with yourself and admit when you've got a challenge, then you're just going to you're gonna keep doing it. And, and it's not a shame not to reach out. The shame is keeping it to yourself because it's just awful. Reach out. There's so many organisations out there. Don't have to go to AA and do the old. You know, I'm a, I've got a problem, and I'm not 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 knocking it. What works for some, it's kind of a non-scientific method. I prefer the understanding addiction from a, you know, a science perspective, which which is a, it's a learned psychological condition. 
like the little rat in a cage, he knows if he pushes that button, he gets a food pellet. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He pushes the button, he gets the food, pushes a button. When you take the food pellets away, what's he do? Pushes a button still, doesn't he? You know, conditioning, conditioning. It's the same with um, substances. When, when your life spirals apart, how do you try and fix it? With more substances, you know? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about alcohol on, on this podcast previously because I've, I've been sober from alcohol for about a year. Um, Brilliant. And, you know, I, I don't think I had like a major problem, but I definitely had some really bad habits and behaviours with alcohol, which I recognised and over enough time I eventually stopped. Um, and I guess thinking about myself, one of the things that I now, I almost attribute it to stopping the alcohol, but it almost it almost in, in turn stops the alcohol as well as is, is staying busy um, and setting goals and <clears throat> you know even this podcast you know is something now that I'm very focused on um, and it keeps me super busy and and I don't almost have a chance to sit there bored thinking about things and, and thinking about maybe having a beer and for me that really that that, that kind of just makes it super easy and you obviously talked about, um, I think you mentioned on, on one of your videos that I saw about that you've traveled to 85 countries, worked in 85 countries, you've achieved your goals, um, your dreams and your goals. I and did most of that off my head. Did you really? Okay, fine. Because <laughs> that was my question was, you know, is, is, is that... Is that I'll say, you, is, I, I say when, what, you know, what I did is in that moment I said when the universe spoke to me, that's my first understanding of what I know now that that we are universe. We, we, we just get that hidden from us from birth. We're told with this birth certificate identity with a little number, mm. which incidentally is allegedly floated on the stock market by the psychopaths. But, um, and we think, you know, and what it does, it traps you into your ego self. So, so everyone's going out and, you know, they're parting their hair this way and looking in the mirror 10 times. And, you know, and, and you see that really now in, 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 in culture. Yeah, everyone's self-conscious and f getting into fashion and beauty. Mag and, and, and what it is, is no, you're not, you're not individual. You're not your five dimension, three dimensional self with these five senses that you're, you're actually the universe is so clever that it experiences itself through you. So in the same way, you wouldn't say two rocks on the beach are different. They've just kind of fallen off the same cliff for crying out loud. You wouldn't call one Bill, one Fred and, you know, buy one a Porsche 911 and, you know, sign the other one up to Netflix. People think you're mad, but with us, we've fallen for that trap. We think we're individual and it's all about, it's not until you can transcend that, that you enter what's called your higher self. And, and you, you physically change the chemicals within. So you'll hear things like serotonin, DMT, dopamine is obviously a quick, easy one to do, which is why people do get into exercise, you know, quick, quick hit there. But it's the serotonin and DMT that um, it, 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 it physiologically changes the way that your body works and that your, your connection with this thing that I realized back then, was it 30 years ago, that, that, I know something is different now. That was my first kind of awakening to it. You, you can, um, you can say, um, and the, 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 you can see my life's gone in a very different way. When I did all the traveling and stuff, mm. that was more like me doing the old proverbial bucket tick list yeah. Uh, a lot of it was driven by, well, look, I've been out of work so long now, mucking around with this and being ill with, like, what, what have I got on my CV? Oh, I've traveled a lot. I mean, I traveled a bit in the Marines. I've done this. I've been in. How did you fund it? Uh, like you said, like you weren't doing a lot. In, it, it, in a very nutshell, nutshell, it's cheaper to travel than it is to live in this rip off <laughs> country. Of so, so what did you right? do? Did you like, like, did you get a plane? Did you? Did you yeah. Okay. So like the, the 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 first thing is, uh, I was in a petrol garage with my late friend. Can I just give a shout out to my friend Rob, right? Who through all this carnage rocked up one day, rocked up outside my house in his Volkswagen Beetle. I was under the bonnet of a Fiesta Super Sport that I bought. It was a dog. The bloody head gasket had blown when he sold it to me i didn't know i'm out there i've had i've got the gasket 
gra- reground. I've bought a new. Ga- I've got the head reground. I've got a new gasket. I'm there clamping it down. I'm twizzling the old valves. To, yeah, I've just and this went on for like a week, and I'm off my head, and I didn't sleep, and I'm obsessive, and I'm trying to get my car back, and I'm, I'm not eating. I'm just chain smoking rollies and 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 drink. You know, drinking coffee in between. You know, in, injecting ultra strong amphetamine, and it, it was it wasn't pretty. I even set up like a tarp so I could work through the rain. You know, it's just meant it was just insane. But anyway, <laughs> Rob bless him rocked up and I looked up and I seen him look at me across the bonnet. I said, Rob. He went, All right, mate. Mm, nah, not really, mate. Well, I'll get upset. He said, I I know, Chris. We all know, mate. He says, fucking put that shit down, come home with me. And that was it. And because I'd had the epiphany lying on the floor shivering and I knew, I knew, you know, this was almost like a bit of a relapse. I'd done more than the £10 that I promised, but only once or twice I did that. And I thought, Chris, this is opportunity, mate. Don't say no to it. Getting, got out of the car about eight times. Rob, can you just wait a sec, mate? I can't remember if I locked the front door. It's all right, mate. Go and, go and do it. Go and lock the front door. Sit back in the car. Oh, Rob, sorry, mate. I can't remember if I locked the front door. It's all right, mate. Go and do it. You know, I'm all self-conscious, you know. This is not normal behaviour. I'm going to go and check the doors. Yeah, I've locked it. I'll get back in the car. Mate... I'm really, really sorry. I I can't remember if I, you know, it's fucking not normal, is it? Eight eight times, bless him. This is what he, you know, got to his house. He went, right, Chris, this is my house. There's my clothes. Wear what you want. That's my food cupboards. Don't fucking ask me for anything. Just help yourself. Um... It's what I want to see you put that shit behind you, mate, you know? Within two days, I was like a different person. Even though I should technically be on the worst come down ever, I'm like living in what was like luxury. Got bar- I was smelling his bath towels. <laughs> God, it's just... God, he's bloody uses Lenore or something. Yeah, I didn't know. Third day, he's like, right, job centre then. I'm like, what? Job centre? I'm like, nah, mate, what it is, it's like, I'm, I'm ill. Job centre. All right, went down to job centre, got myself a job in a pub, you know? Not saying it was the end of my issues. <laughs> God, um, did cause a few, but one day I'm out with my mate Simon, uh, rest in peace, and we, uh, he was getting some stuff in a petrol garage, and I looked down at the free, free ads, the free newspaper. I picked it up and had a look, and lo and behold, on the back was an advert Volunteers needed to work in Africa. Great um, uh, training provided. I'm like, whoa, what? No, don't need a degree or nothing. Okay. So I phoned the number. I went for an interview in London, rocked up in my suit, my old business suit and a tie. And I looked in there and everyone's like in jeans and like skate shoes and scruffy t. I'm like, oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> anyway, went in. They said, yeah, we're a, a Scandinavian organisation. You come over to us for six months. You live on a, a top of a mountain in a, in a ski lodge, old ski lodge, 60, 70 students from all around the world, Japan, you, all over Europe, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and you study as a team for six months in like eight man, 10 man teams. Each team goes a different place. Your team, Chris, will be going to Mozambique. Um, you've got a choice way. I said, right, I want the one on the beach, please. I want to be out in a dugout canoe fishing with a, you know, and it was Mozambique's like your Tarzan films, you know. It, it was just, so I'm up in this mountain. I'm teaching people to build snow caves. I'm out cross-country skiing every day, which we learned in the Marines, and I'm just, I'm, back on life there's no substances or alcohol at all in this organization so that wasn't even a you know consideration um it was just incredible i i I worked with those kids in mozambique just had a just absolutely brilliant time with them 
used to go out and dance around the drums in the, in the evening in the villages and while I was there they said Chris would you drive a team to India and back to write articles on people that live in poverty would I drive a bus to India and back <laughs> yes you know I met a guy when I was we had to fundraise in Scandinavia for our projects we used to sell postcards on the street uh, with little pictures of African kids like building a well or whatever on them right and I was really good at it I said, right, folks, today I'm going to go and beat a record. It was like this 20-year record at this this college, school, whatever we call it. And uh, someone had raised 3,000 3, crowns in one day. 3,000 kroner, it's like, um, you know, 300 quid. I went out and I, I sold 11,000, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because, you know, when I'm good, I'm good, you know, and I'm back on it now and I, I'm passionate and um, and that's what I did. And to raise the money to get to this school, because you had to pay about two grand school fees. Um, you didn't get, it was all voluntary. You didn't get paid or nothing, but you had to pay this fee up front. Oh, sorry. The thing about the fundraising is I, I led a team to Finland. The team I led, we raised more than every other team in the school, all like put together, even though the people were just all nervous. I just used my skills. I'm like, listen, folks, nobody bugger off got a problem and you're struggling come and speak to me and by the way we're going to put all the money in together so there's no John Waynes no heroes I uh, got back to when I was in Africa I got a letter it was from the governor of a place called Pori like the mayor of a town called Pori in uh, uh, Finland it said dear Chris um, the time that I met you in Finland that like, truly changed my life I've never met someone like you before um as such with with you know with the work you're doing i put you forth for the second level commendation of finland <laughs> he says uh and you'll be pleased to know the board granted it you know you know you know what's it called across the board uh on the grounds of human generosity so, so i got a medal from finland um and yeah, that was it. And to raise the money to get out there, I did a, a fire walk. So I was officially the kind of world record fire walker back then, simply because there was no world record. Right? <laughs> by and fire I, walker? When you yeah, walk over hot coals. What you <laughs> They lit in the air. I've, I've done yeah, one. I did it yeah. down at uh, so Ash Yacht Club. Right. How far um, did you walk across? Uh, so I, I learned it on the Tony Robbins course when I left the Marines, cause I was all that business, you know, all, all about making money. I went on Tony Robbins, unleash the dragon with it, unleash the top power within, is it? Um, and on the first night of that three day weekend in London, it's at Ali Pali that you, you all go out and do the fire walk. It's a bit tame, to be honest. By the time I got to do it, there's like about three embers of yeah. a, a, a light. But, <laughs> but when I was struggling, I took myself off down to the banks of the Tamar and I just got a load of reeds and, and, and driftwood, built this big, long fire, mm. set it alight, and uh, I thought, right, come on, do your skills. What was it? <sighs> Calm down, tune into the universe. <clears throat> cool moss, cool moss, cool moss. And I... Did this far for right now? Let's do it again to raise money to get me out to this school. This uh, school, so I did that, and it got in a, in a big thing in the Herald about it, and it showed a lot of people that had lost all their faith in me. That you know, don't ever lose faith in someone because you just you know you never know. So, so sorry, I forgot your original. <laughs> I think it was around the funding, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I did want to just jump jump on to um, a bit about men's health, if, if we can, Chris. Let me just answer your question. I travelled the whole world, yeah. right, for less than five quid a day, right? Okay, it was uh, two, around about two, 2000 to 2005 I did all my travelling. That's when I said, right, I'm going to go everywhere I want. Every single country in America's, in, from Alaska down to Argentina, uh, many of the Caribbean islands as well, all, pretty much all of Asia, pretty much all of Europe, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand. I've caught piranhas in the Amazon. Just, just everything I ever, everything I ever wanted to do. But the thing is, 
you just got to seize the opportunity. You've got to look at your schedule and think, right, if I can shift that a week there, speak to my boss there and get that, there's three weeks there. That's enough to get down to the Amazon jungle and have a bloody great time, you know? If you've got a reasonable boss that doesn't mind giving you like a couple of months off, you know, unpaid or whatever. And I would have a tent on my back, backpack, machete, um, cooker, buy food in the market, or in Bolivia, free course meal was 75p. I get the guidebook out, find the cheapest backpacker every place that I stopped if I wasn't in the tent. You know, so I'm staying for like two quid a night at places. Not not that, you know, not a hotel, but I, I want I wasn't going for luxury, I was going for experience. And the more I can make my money work, um, the longer I can stay traveling and I don't have to go back to reality, do I? Yeah, I think a lot of people can travel and do it quite cheaply, yeah. can't they? Yeah, and I absolutely. worked in a fish factory in Norway for nine months, having an absolute great time, getting absolutely hammered on moonshine with, with the noggies. Wonderful bunch. They just, they looked after me so well. Uh, learning the language, you know, chopping salmon for the Japanese sushi market, believe it or not, was fascinating. Diving in the, in, 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 in the, in the sea. We lived on a little island and, um, I saved nine grand in nine months, uh, nine grand in nine months, and I paid my mortgage back home. Well, I only everywhere left on the planet are marked off, um, including little countries in South America where you've got to get a tiny plane to get to them. When I got on the plane, I remember the stewardess come over. She said, "Did you just say that I heard you say you're a pilot?" I said, "Yeah." She said, "Oh, do you want to sit in the front of the plane then? With you know, you can be co-pilot." I'm like, "Yes." I was only a private pilot, but, but you know, it was just 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 incredible. I remember once the captain was laughing, laughing with his co-pilot, and I I said, I knew it was about me. I said, "What what what's funny?" And 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 he, and he said, "You got a bow and arrow." We don't usually let people onto flights. With, this is like <laughs> after 9-11, you know, with a bow and arrow. But it was a souvenir bow and arrow. And they, 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 knew, they knew that I bought it off, a, off an Indian in the jungle. Um, but yeah, you know, you just got to make it work. I learned to fly. I got learned to fly. It cost me £3,000 plus a trip to or, return to Orlando. Um, that's not a lot of money. I mean, OK, it was this was like 15 years ago now or something. You just got, to, it's like, what do you want in life? You know, what, what do you want? Do, do, it's, it's what you want, isn't it? And if you want it bad enough, then. Where, where was your, where was your favorite, just a quick one. Where was your favorite place? Um, I really like Belize. I like snorkeling and diving. Belize, so, yeah? Yeah. It's, it, they really looked after the national park there. So it's not like dive sites in say Thailand or the Great Barrier Reef where everything's dead, all the coral's dead. Everyone's stomped on it with their novice diving skills. They've looked after it. So you're in, it's like you're swimming in a fish, a tropical fish tank. You know, there's lobster everywhere. There's manatees, there's sea cows. Or I don't know which one's which, but uh, there's the, all these like little finding Nemo fish everywhere. And uh yeah, you can snorkel with whale sharks. We dived in a, in a big blue hole. I got about 40 metres down. It was a very deep dive. You can't stay at 40 metres very long, like about six minutes. And as I'm finning along, finning along, the instructor turned around and he, <laughs> he goes like this, shark. And I turn around and uh, there's like 12 sharks just swimming literally straight at me. And they kind of veered off about there and went across there <laughs> by which time I got my hand on my, my diver's knife and the one at the back I didn't realize until we had our uh, debrief and someone said did you know that one at the back was a bull shark <laughs> <laughs> I was like responsible for the most attacks on, on, yeah. on mm. but it was fine it wasn't it wasn't you know um, but yeah Belize Belize was uh, Belize was but you know paradise is I I inside you isn't it so it, it, it's all a bit, you know, pros and cons. Mm, yeah. Um, men's mental health is obviously a massive issue in the UK. Um, suicide's the biggest killer in men under 50. Um, I think on average, every two hours, a man takes his own life. Um, and you've talked a lot about, obviously, your struggles and your journey and um, your travelling. You've touched on, like, the third dimension a couple of times as well. But I wanted to ask you what you, what you think's going on there and... 
and what you think that the reason that men are maybe struggling so much might be? Well, I guess this goes back to a crisis in masculinity. Okay. So back in the, you know, back in the day, uh, a man's pathway was very set, wasn't it? He either fire, followed his father into the factory or the dockyard or into the fields. Mm. And that's what a man did and culture was around it and that was your life, life, life plan. Now, it's not just that these um, avenues are no longer there because of automation and everything going out to India or whatever it is. It's that the the route for a young man out of school, you you could be forgiven for thinking it's a bit pants, you know? Seriously, what bloke wants to work in a call centre? Uh, and no disrespect for people who enjoy it. I've done it. Oh, my God. Mm, oh, my God. It was <laughs> like, it. Oh, 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 gosh. Anyway, um, who wants to sit behind a computer screen? I got hammered for saying this the other day because people misunderstood what I meant. But when I grew up, you call data entry, sitting typing all day, you call it a woman's job. No disrespect to the wonderful women out there, but... You know, it was like blokes don't do that. They're out doing a roughy toughy, you know, fighting sharks and all that. No. Now, the blokes are doing that. How emasculated must you feel that you ain't out there, you know, in the killer commandos? You're not out there jumping out of aeroplane. You're not there climbing up K2. You're, you're sat doing girly work. And sorry, that is patronising now, but I'm just trying to... I'm, 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 you, you ask me why people are killing themselves. Well, why it, men are killing it, themselves. It, you, you, know, what, what, it, it, you know, we've got to get real and see, see it for what it is. Societies destroy people. Society traumatises people from birth. School systems indoctrination. It's all called what are called controlled by big club which is this network of international uh, psychopath trillionaire businessmen that literally think we're scum. I mean, they literally sit around tables planning how they can hate us more. Um, and you, when, once, you, once you see it, then you start, you'll see it everywhere. And they've traumatized everyone for life. You've got people... Um, very insecure about who they are, suffering social phobias and, you know, this kind of thing. And at the same time, it's locked them into the birth certificate identity and ego. So it's all about the person. There's no connection to divinity. We're divine. We are part of this incredibly great experiment. And that is your first. That's your first protocol. Chris, who are you? Well, I'm universe. Of course I am. Um, uh, you want to call it God? I'm fine with that. You know, that's what we are. It, it's, you know, paradise is inside. It's not, you're not, you know, I love Belize, but not, you're not going to find that there. It's, 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 and all, all this has been hidden from people. And then they've been, you know, hammered with the beauty culture and the men's magazines and the gym culture and the, and military is a big one, you know? The deludedness of people in this country of what they think the military is, is just chronically sad, you know. Um, it's just terribly sad. People, people think that's a hero's job. No, a hero's job is being in service of your fellow man, mm -hmm. uh, you know, helping people through mental health. Maybe you're a nurse in a hospital. Maybe you're serving someone in a shop and you're doing it with a smile and you're... you're you know, adding to that person's day. That's called being in service. Massacring people on behalf of a psychopathic ruling elite so they could get more oil revenue or, you know, uh, uh, push mass immigration into Europe, which is another of their, you know, tactics to just, just destroy our culture here. When you say Don't, there, who do you mean? Uh, what, who's behind this? Well, yeah, you well, say a lot of the time you refer to as, you know, they're trying to do this and they're trying to do it. I'd like... I always, I always wonder who is the. So, I, so yeah, so I guess on that, and I think he's maybe asking for the audience because a lot of people will hear some of this and think about conspiracy theories and the Matrix and that type of thing. Yeah. But yeah, so like, who are these people? Like, how do we know they actually exist? Well, they do exist because you know, 
uh, if you see global events um, and you see how many people are massacred off the back of them. Um, do, you not, do you not think that's just governments in their agendas, though? Uh, no. No. You don't think that? No. You think it's something bigger than that? Uh, I'd say there's a dark agenda out there and, they prob- and they've infiltrated not just governments, all, all positions. They network, they do it really, really well. Uh, you got to... There's a lot you've got to understand before you're going to see this. So you've got to understand the money system. goes back, give or take, 8,000 years to ancient Babylon. used to be a simple sy- system of exchange. So, you know, Danny paints my fence. I can't paint, you know, his front door because I'm busy, so I, I give him free cockle shells. Danny can take that anywhere in the province, Free cockle shells is recognised, that's, that's painting your door. Or you can maybe swap it for a chicken. You know, this, this, it was a simple system of exchange. Mm-hmm. And then the, um, uh, the greedy people got in and went, oh, do you know what? What we can do is people that haven't got any cockle, we can actually lend them some. When they come to pay it back to us, they've got to pay back one more, okay? Interest, okay? Usury, it's called in religious terms. Um, Usury banned in, under Islam because they reckon it's it, uh, because they recognise it's the way to complete slavery of, of man, mankind. Um, in allegorical uh, historical terms, it's called money magic. It's the ability to create money out of nowhere and then charge people in interest on it, which is what your mortgage is. You borrow this money from a bank. They haven't got that money because on it, it says this is this one pound or this five pounds is um, redeemable in gold. Well, it doesn't say that anymore because they've stolen all the gold. Your money's just a bit of paper. They knock up the figures on a computer screen and then silly us. We go to work for the next 40 years to pay all this interest back on money that they haven't even got. They've only got to have 10 percent value in in their votes, right? It's called money magic. Um, and then I'd say getting to sort of your 1600s, you had uh, certain cults that came out of the Middle East practicing pretty sort of vile stuff. Uh, each of them seemed to have their, their new messiah. So, you know, their, their new sort of God figure. Uh, you had underground fraternities in, in Europe using the esoteric methods of communication. So uh, things like Knights Templar and this, the, you know, they came back from the Crusades. They brought knowledge of uh, uh, Masonic sort of knowledge because um, obviously pyramids are in, um, you know, people that uh, the, the Masons rather, they had all this um, encoded knowledge because I mean the pyramids in Egypt the the numerology around them and the the um, what are we saying the, the the hidden science is just incredible oh, the accuracy is crazy yeah, yeah. I wouldn't even accurate. pretend like I'm you know but when you understand it's a line like this for a reason uh, that the, I reckon it was a hydrogen producing energy mach- machine do they know all, 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 all this kind of stuff um, and so you had the, the, the Templars coming back from the Crusades bringing uh, this knowledge which they incorporated into building cathedrals through Europe, at which point they got persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church, who went after them, and a certain king. So they took this knowledge underground, and this is kind of your beginnings of your masonry and this this kind of stuff. And no, we're not having a go at Freemasons here, um, of which I know several grand grandmasters. I've got as quite good friends, but they wouldn't get this conversation. You know, they they to them it's just like a club. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so you, you've got this interesting uh, um, 
mix. And then, of course, you've got the European banking aristocracy who very much are into like funding each side of a war to play this off against this country off against this one da 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 and then when they decide to pull the plug here they know it's going to create a run on the bank there they know that this you know the, the, this here is going to crash and of course where does the money come it all you know all comes back to them and you see that now you see when there's a um, financial crash what happens who who is it that loses their businesses uh, all for, for throughout the COVID thing. Well, it's the person in the street, isn't it? It's the small man. It's the butchers, the bakers, the 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 you know the hardware or the iron mongers. Or, uh, they, they all lose, and, and who wins? Well, B and Q wins, doesn't it? They they get even more powerful and stronger, and uh, McDonald's and you know it's it's um. It's yeah, they, and they're very clever. And it and it's said that round about 1666, these three groups sort of come together to plan their uh, control. You could say you you could say, and um, you, the proofs in the pudding. I mean, you just asked me why are so many men killing themselves? Well, because these nut jobs have a lot of sway, you know, an awful lot of sway. They don't teach those young men in school, listen, you're born perfect. I've just said, I've said this, haven't I? You, you're perfect as you are. You don't you've got to prove yourself to nobody. Yeah. You don't have to go join in the military and, you know, waging war on a, on a, uh, on a country that's done absolutely nothing to you. So, so, so much of that seems obviously completely out of our control. So the, the everyday person, the everyday man, obviously can't influence, you know, the elites and <clears throat> their agenda. So, so what can what can people do? What can men do to to survive this period in time? Well, you've got to get on the spiritual battle because, like you said, you know, if you look at someone like Nikola Tesla uh, or Einstein, they they would tell you life is energy, vibration, and frequency. If you want the answers to the universe that that's where you you need to start and so if life's energy vibration and frequency and you want to have an effect upon it you want to affect change then that's got to start in your mind hasn't it with your your uh, thought form processes and so if you look at my story so I decided one day things have got to change as a result I put this system together over the years uh, of, of many different things. First, I never listen to anyone who tells me I can't do anything. I've just learned that they're, they're, <laughs> they're talking about themselves, mm -hmm, right? and then I just get on and do it. Completely uh, agree. Um, uh, second, I jog around a block. I, I wake up, say thank you to the sun. Mm -hmm. That's me thanking the universe because I'm still here. A lot of my mates are dead now. Um, some in the Marines killed in horrible circumstances. I'm not dead. I'm still smashing it. And I, I don't want to be dead, thank you very much. And I'm really grateful for that, you know. The chance that I'm here is a trillion, trillion, trillion to one shot. And I'm here and, I'm, and I appreciate that. Gratitude is where it starts. I then jog around the block. I don't care if it's a quarter of a mile, three mile, 20 mile. You know, personally, I'll do the quarter of a mile if it's if, if just to say I've done something. Gets air in your lungs, air... Uh, releases endorphins in the brains, alkalizes your body, gets you firing at the beginning of the day. I come back, hot shower, cold shower, or as cold as you can get it. It doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to be like Wim Hof or anything, you know. I built a sauna now and a plunge pool, so I've got the full Monty and I love it, right? But, <laughs> but, but you don't need that, you know. Why, why do we do that? Well, the, the, because go back to our, our primate self when we lived in the forest, we, we didn't have houses to live in. We'd have a cave if we were lucky. When we was out foraging, if it rained, you got wet. You I quite need, like running you know. in the rain. I quite like it. Just, yeah, a lot of do people... Do you know what I mean? Do. I, I do. It, it, can, it triggers certain chimpanzees in chimpanzee tribes. Some of them go absolutely mental. No, the rest like, kind of curl up under a <laughs> banana leaf. But, um, so, that you know, this is all stuff people can do tomorrow morning it is simple it's what i teach in life coaching it's so simple but you have to love yourself enough to take action you know 
And yet, and hot shower, cold shower, cold as you can get it. Lunchtime, eat vegetables. You know, this is a this this something so difficult for us to grasp because we've been so bamboozled by this diet, that diet. That, this is nothing to do with diet. Your ancestors for trillions upon trillions of years, which is, you know, ev evolution, they didn't have tools. They couldn't go and get, you know, a cow every day. Um, it's not how it worked. We would have picked roots, shoots, leaves. Little shoots have so much, like, protein in them and, and you know, stuff that we wouldn't even understand, mushrooms, you know, all stuff that has a very low acidic that creates a low rate of acid in, 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 in the body. Acid, if you ask me, being the root cause of pretty much most, most illness. Um, what that does is when your body gets the 7.25 um, on the pH balance, you're changing your crystal. Remember, it's all about energy vibration and frequency. It's tuning into that higher power. You're not going to do it if you're toxic because you're on McDonald's every day and drinking a bottle of wine. You're just literally cutting yourself off from that beautiful feeling that those of us that are there live in, you know, not, not all the time. Sometimes we, we slip. And so what, and, and then spend five minutes in the afternoon being present. That's the past doesn't exist. Whether you think it does or not, it doesn't. If you think it exists, try and go and get a banana from the fruit bowl when you was a kid. I promise you're not going to be able to do it. So stop wasting your time. It doesn't exist. No one cares what you did in the past. If you did something naughty, you're forgiven. Move on. Forget about it. It's, it's called depression. Living in the future doesn't exist either. Uh, it would be great if it did, wouldn't it? We could probably put some bet on at the bookies and we'd all be multi-billionaires. But, you know, that's anxiety. Forget about it. Stop, stop. You know, as we all sit here now, the roof ain't going to come crashing in and no one's going to burst through the door and make us all pregnant, are they? It's beautiful. We're in paradise. That's it. Life's paradise, you know. Occasionally you get a challenge, but when you live this way, they're easier to deal with. Now, what happens there? So I'm living in paradise because I don't live in the past and, and the present. My body's alkaline, so I'm picking up this beautiful energy, which, which people might hear was like kundalini and this kind of stuff, but we'll, we won't go there for this one. But just to say you buzz. Like in the old days, we took pills to get this feeling. Now you've got it because you're alkaline, you stimulated your vagus nerve, you've got dop dopamine fired off in your brain, your, your milk and honey, that's a biblical reference now, or scriptural reference, that's your serotonin and DMT. In the scriptures, milk and honey was your paradise, right? It's because serotonin looks like milk or, and um, DMT, looks like honey or it might be the other way around right? hence you enter the land of milk and honey when your brain starts producing this now what happens as a result so you're happy because your gratitude your brain's kicking off your vagus nerves stimulated you've got no worries about the future you go out your front door happier don't you you go out smiling and instead of being a phone zombie or one of these people that's just so broken they've lost the ability to smile at a fellow which is everyone now and maybe i'm exaggerating a wee bit but i run every morning i jog right right i try to say hello to everyone i see because that's called community right that person who i say hello to maybe no one spoke to him for a week maybe they're just off home to bloody hang himself you you know you see i've changed my thoughts my behavior's changed I'm firing, I'm out the door, I'm putting out a better energy, aren't I? I'm putting out a better energy than when I was lying on the floor shivering from, from crystal meth addiction, mm -hmm. you know? That person's now happier. They've gone home and go, do you know, I'm not going to top myself today. I'm going to pick up the phone and call my brother. I haven't spoke to him for, you know, energy. Yeah. Brother gets a phone call in Australia. Oh, my brother called me today. Right, do you know what? I'm going to pick the surfboard up, go for it. So I haven't done that for... Too long now. It's been free with, you know, en energy. This is how you change. Mm -hmm. This is how you beat these psychos that live. Whatever you want to think they are, you know, it, 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 it. when you own a music industry in a Hollywood, 
and all the ta- all the media world worldwide, and you just put out a crucifying message of evil and hate. You know, like I said earlier about the video of someone come on my podcast. She she said one thing wrong in a podcast. She's sixty years old for crying out loud. She got someone's name a little bit. Jesus, she was viciously attacked. This is the culture that the the psychopaths will, they love it. They're stealing your energy. But why do you think they're doing that? Do you think it's to destroy ourselves? It's just a control, I guess, isn't it? It's a lot of things. First of all, they feed off the energy. Um, You know, they're feeding off society's negative en- energy basically this is the the age-old battle of good against it e- um, good against evil right uh secondly they've got that i don't know if you want to think of it as an uh, as the new world order but it's you know when you can lock everybody on the planet in their homes for you know best part of two years getting them so pissing their pants that they're scared to go near other human beings not understanding incidentally that we've come through trillions of years folks your ancestors are legends and yours and mine impervious to all this kind of illness ice ages famine scarcity we can water fast for 40 days i i know because my friend john does it regularly i've done it 18 days you don't need to eat that's to get you between food grounds in the nature right um did they our ancestors didn't have bloody hand gel right this is just when you when you've got the power to put people under that spell People on a remote island in Polynesia that have never seen a, a white person are suddenly wearing their underpants on their face and not talking to their neighbour because their neighbour refuses to. That is powerful control. So there's your answer, you know. There, there, there's your answer. And it's not going to stop until we start to understand, as Sun Tzu said, know your enemy know how they operate so then you're one step ahead of them and i'll tell you how they operate they're killing the love they're killing the divinity they're not letting people know their true selves young men are falling by the wayside because they're in this system it makes no sense to them they don't want to like work in bloody little this is why everyone hero worships the military now they see these guys actually like getting out and like doing what they feel that they can't do um, and that's a, a myth. If you actually knew what it's like to be in it, it's not, it's not really quite like that, you know? And, and what's the big thing about the military? Massive mental health statistics, biggest number of suicides, biggest number of the homeless popular. So what does that tell you? Again, massive lie that we're all living under. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've got to thank you for allowing us to have this, this conversation. But these guys won't stop. To them, it's all about you know, material wealth and gold and, and uh, watching the, the minions, you know, run around doing silly things, thinking that, that it's in their interest. Um, it, 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 it's ever encroaching. You've got the 15-minute cities now. So they're telling you you're not allowed to go within 50 minutes of where, where, where you live. You've got the, the smart grid, which is... 24 hour surveillance etc etc and it just it it you know it won't stop until we call it out and we see it you know um why do i not need to live in a smart group well i can tell i'm 53 years old my life's been brilliant it's these guys that are mucking it up you know why don't i you know go along with the 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 health narrative that's put out by multi trillionaire psychopathic pharmaceutical company well a because i recognize that's exactly what they are b because i haven't been ill for 20 years i eat vegetables my body i test myself with strip i don't anymore because i know what i am but you buy ph strips on ebay for two pound fifty does anyone do it no, because they don't understand we're a living organism. You can't just drink Coca-Cola all the time um, and, 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 and eat chicken. It, it just doesn't work like that, you know? And so the whole, the whole narrative's a lie. And I just encourage anyone to get to the point where you realise 
it's all a lie, everything. Your education's been a lie, your banking system's a lie, your nutrition is a lie, your m media, or at least the mainstream media, you know, that's all a lie. Your understanding of yourself, your divinity, your in, in touch with the eternal, that's all been hidden from you. Your religion is a massive lie. They're not going to tell you what I just told you, that the land of milk and honey, it's not a place for the Israelites for crying out loud. It's talking about serotonin and DMT. These scriptures are way, way cleverer than telling fairy tales. It's by clever people over the ages that understand what we're discussing now, but they couldn't say it because they'd be put to death. For, for challenging the ruling power at the time. So they encoded it in this code that once you, once you get it, then then you can, you know, Moses he has his staff of uprighteousness. Mm -hmm. Moses being the Old Testament Jesus, Jesus being the chrism, um, Christ, the anointed one in, in Greek, anointed with the sacred secretion, which is your Kundalini, which is a chemical occurrence that happens every month when you, you've got all your dominoes in in you know what do you call it in check you know you've got to have your diet right you've got to be have your thinking right be on terms love with all people no matter what they've done to, to done to you you've got to be able to commune with the energy what some people call god that's your meditation your mind mindfulness um and when you do that thing and 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 and, and you're in service and you're living for other people rather than just your own self egregious gain. That's your staff. Yes, you, that's what the staff represents, living an upright life. Of course, what's he got on his staff? He's got the snake, hasn't he? Which still to this day, good health is, is symbolized by a staff with the snakes wrapped around it. I think, like, you know, you, 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 you see that in international organizations and, um, and, uh, you know, it's all allegory. So he comes down, he's been meditating on the mountain, so he speaks to God. In that meditation, which is not like a guy on a cloud, is it? He, he goes, right, hang on, people got to live righteous. Don't cover your neighbor's ox. Don't be greedy. Don't drink like all the white. Yeah, this is, this is good stuff. Goes back down. What are the Israelites doing? They've lost faith in the energy. They've built themselves a golden calf. Baal kind of like devil worship they 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 don't believe enough so he comes down oi you lot <laughs> pack it in you, you, you know pack it in the, you, you don't take your power and put it outside of you that's not how it works you take it from in you and you transmute it into into the all the everything and this i mean if people listen out, like Chris, got no clue what you're going on about. Do you know what? I say, good. That's how it, that's, now you can understand how much has been hidden from you. Because what I just said, you should just be like, yeah, got it, mate. You're bang on. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, Chris, it's been absolutely fascinating, mate. <laughs> um, we are a little bit out of time, I think. But obviously, you've got an amazing podcast yourself. Um, so we'll put the link for that in our description so people can come and check it out. Yes, present for you guys. This, uh, this is my third memoir, State of Mind. This talks a little bit about how I formulated my mind to run the length of the country uh, with no training. <laughs> uh, uh, ultra marathon a day for 36 days with a 15 kit or what at least started as a 15 kilogram backpack I did chuck some stuff away um but yeah that one's for you guys so Cheers, thank, you. Brilliant, thank, thank you thank you for having me absolute pleasure mate it's been Cheers, a mate. No problem thank you very, Thanks much. very much Cheers, Cheers, mate. Mate.